Thank you for joining us today. We'll begin in a few moments. For those of you just joining us, we will begin in one minute. Welcome. My name is Piper Chapman, and I am the Assistant Director at Harvard Alumni Travels. Thank you for joining us today for our travel talk, The Other Darwin, Alfred Russell Wallace and the Origin of Species, presented by James Costa. Before I turn things over to our speaker, I'd like to review the format for today's Zoom webinar. For the duration of our one hour lecture, your video and microphone will be turned off so we can direct our attention to our speaker. On the bottom of your screen, you will see several buttons to interact with. Please insert your questions in the Q&A box. You will also see a chat box, which is intended for comments, sharing information, and to engage with fellow alumni. To chat the entire audience, please select everyone when submitting your comment. For those of you who would like to hide this chat feature, you may do so by moving it to the side of your screen. Closed captioning is available and you will find it by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Should you have any technical issues, please message our support team by selecting HAA support in the chat. And as a reminder, the lecture will be recorded and shared with you. Finally, we appreciate your patience should we experience technological glitches or delays due to the nature of our virtual environment. Please be aware that you can adjust your sound preferences on your personal device. I invite you to acquaint yourselves with your fellow Zoom attendees by sharing your name and location in the chat box. I see that some of you have already started to do that, so thank you. I am so thrilled to pass this over to James Costa, but first, a brief word about our speaker. James is the executive director of the Highlands Biological Station in Highlands, North Carolina, and professor of biology at Western Carolina University, where he teaches biogeography and the history of evolutionary thinking. Jim is a longtime research associate in entomology in the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard University. Jim has authored several books, and his most recent is An Alfred Russell Wallace Companion, and he is currently working on books relating to Darwin and Wallace for Princeton University Press. In 2017, Jim was awarded the Wallace Medal, and so I think it goes without saying that we are so fortunate to have him with us today to talk about this fascinating explorer as we approach the centennial year of his birth. So without further ado, I would love to hand the virtual mic over to you, Jim. Great. Thanks so much, um, Piper, for that very nice introduction. Just going to start my slides here. Just want to thank you. Um, thank you for this wonderful um, invitation. I'm really appreciative of your efforts and really your whole your whole team, all my friends there at the HAA, um, and, a, and a big welcome to all of you who have kind of virtually joined us. Um, really a great pleasure to, to be here with you and um, getting a, uh, having a chance to share um, one of my passions, you know, Darwin and, and Wallace. And of course, I'm going to focus mainly on on Wallace today, but inevitably, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about about both of them. Um, in fact, you notice that Darwin inevitably, you know, 
uh, finds his way into most conversations about Wallace. You see that he's in the title of this presentation. And, you know, some might say, well, that's the problem. You know, Wallace, you know, he should be able to stand on his own. He's always sort of in Darwin's shadow or being compared to Darwin, you know, that sort of thing. And, uh, well, I, I agree. Um, but I think that, um, you know, I, by the end of today's presentation, I hope that you'll have a better appreciation of the depth and the breadth of Alfred Russell Wallace's thought and um, just how true that is that he stands on his own in a very profound way. So um, that's where I'm kind of going today. I want to kind of give you a, a bit of a comparison, try to understand the trajectory of Darwin's thinking, um, especially his seminal discoveries about transmutation or evolution by natural selection, and also the trajectory of Wallace and how remarkably parallel they are. Um, so Wallace, as I think many of you likely know, is um, you know, just a remarkable figure in the history of, of science. You know, he's a preeminent tropical biologist of his day, certainly. Uh, we honor him as the founder of modern evolutionary biogeography, uh, as the co-discoverer with Darwin of the principle of, of natural selection. Um, and we can understand uh, the two of them as having come to natural selection um, in, in interesting ways. You know, uh, Darwin, I like to think of as the kind of reluctant evolutionist, kind of led to his ideas almost, um, you know, uh, against his own expectations, not something he was seeking out. Uh, whereas I think of Alfred Russell Wallace as the eager convert, you know, someone who kind of came to this idea of transmutation, as evolution was called, and immediately seized upon it and became um, deeply interested in trying to ferret this out. Um, interesting pathways. And you're all aware, too, I'm sure, that, you know, they, they both hit upon um, this this process that is known by the name Darwin gave it, natural selection. Um, but they... Although these are substantially the same theories that the two of them came to, uh, they were reached by a rather different path. So I'll give you a feel for that as well today. So that's kind of where, where I'm going with this presentation and kind of makes sense to think about commonalities, first of all. Um, cer certainly there are many differences and we don't have time to get into, you know, a lot of um, biographies of these two remarkable individuals. Um, just kind of looking at their intellectual trajectory, we can see that um, they both have sort of common uh, sources of inspiration in thinking about um, natural philosophy, as science was called then. Um, certainly the, the great geologist Charles Lyell, who later became a good friend, uh, especially of Darwin's, um, the writings of Alexander von Humboldt. Um, curiously, there's a um, you know, remarkable you know, dual interest in beetles. Both Wallace and Darwin became at, at, at different times just really passionate about beetles and, and collecting them and getting a feel for their, uh, their, their diversity and their variations and such. A um, you know, number of commonalities, um, certainly, but very different paths. You know, they, had, they lived, of course, rather different lives um, growing up. Darwin, you know, something of a, a life of, of privilege um, and really becoming excited about natural philosophy, um, mainly as a college student in, in Cambridge at Christ College. Um, Darwin um, was fortunate to be able to travel the world on HMS Beagle as a young man just out of university at age 21. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a common misunderstanding that Darwin somehow set out on that voyage to solve some mystery about species origins, or even that he had a eureka moment, a great insight during that trip. And um, neither of those is true. You know, Darwin, again, kind of almost against his own expectations, found himself really pondering, you know, observations he had made, collections he had made, beginning to connect some dots. And it wasn't until some months later after his return home that um, he suddenly sort of had this idea that um, some of these patterns really only made sense in the context of transmutation. And here you see um, just a, a quote from a diary entry from late summer of, um, of 1837, where he comments on how in July he opened his first notebook on the transmutation of species. And what had he been struck by? He'd been struck by the character of South American fossils, right? And their relationship to species now living in South America and also species on the Ar Galapagos archipelago, um, especially their relationships, not so much island to island, but how distinctive this group was yet related to mainland species in South America. And he commented at that point in his diary that 
those facts originated all of his views. Um, so his essential insight at that early stage was species relationships in space and time really suggest species change over time. Um, but if they change, how do they change? You know, how exactly? And it, I think it's, it's interesting that he very quickly came to this idea that he could perhaps gain some insight into this process by, um, by studying um, the manuals and the writings of the animal breeders. Um, this sense that uh, the animal breeders, the, the business of, of improvement of, of, of breeds and development of new varieties, um, this was the business of working with species and, and, and varieties. And so he immersed himself in this literature and he read you know, the manuals of, of Seabright and Bakewell, Wilkinson and others. And uh, it's interesting that these breeders well understood their art, right? They used terms like picking and choosing and selecting uh, among varieties and improving breeds. And here's a, here's a quote from um, one manual by John Saunders Seabright, um, where he very explicitly points out that many people would mistakenly think that you improve or you make a new breed simply by crossing existing breeds. And Seabright says in this passage, no, that's not true. Um, this is really a process of selection, right? Um, and he, in another place, calls it judicious selection. And we see Darwin in his private notebooks at the time commenting that the whole art of making varieties can be inferred from the facts stated by Seabright. Um, so this really, I think, convinces him that, you know, there's something about the, um, the, the breeder's art um, in terms of uh, changing um, species and varieties. Uh, easy enough to see how that's done in the garden or the barnyard, but how does that happen in nature? You know, this became his, his, his focus. And, and I think it's remarkable that it didn't take him long to hit upon a solution. It was only not even a year and a half later, really, after becoming convinced of transmutation that, um, that Darwin, by his own account, was reading um, the Reverend Thomas Robert Malthus on population and thinking about struggle and population pressure and this idea of a, um, of a kind of selection dynamic, a natural selection dynamic came to mind. As he described it later, um, that then was this theory that he had to work with. So I wanna just point out that unlike Wallace, rather quickly after becoming a convinced transmutationist, Darwin hit upon this mechanism that he was convinced was you know, the, uh, the solution to the question of species origins. And all of his subsequent work really involved um, following out lines of evidence to see how far he could apply this idea. And we see that in Darwin's private notebooks, um, here where um, there's one very almost breathless passage that he has in one of his notebooks, where he comments to himself that once you grant that species may change, right? The whole fabric, he says, totters and falls, uh, which is a very you know, interesting, cryptic, maybe evocative statement. The whole fabric of what? The whole fabric of, of maybe the scientific understanding of species, um, but maybe much more than that. Maybe, maybe the whole societal fabric that's built upon a very particular uh, understanding uh, and application of scripture is about to fall. Um, he, he noticed the, the, the words he uses here. He uh, has this note to self, you know, look abroad, study gradation, unity of type, geographical distribution, the relationship of fossil species with currently living species. This is sort of a memorandum of lines of evidence to pursue. Um, and it's well documented, well known that really, um, you know, his, his whole life was uh, spent after this point in pursuit of these lines of evidence. Certainly a number of these lines of evidence uh, were used to um, strengthen his arguments for what was to become on the origin of species, but really continued after that with his subsequent books where he was uh, following out and reinforcing some of his, um, his uh, evolutionary insights from the origin of species. Um, so that, that kind of lifelong um, uh, uh, program that Darwin pursued, what he called his experimentizing. Um, I, I explore in my book, Darwin's Backyard, and it makes for a fascinating um, story in itself.
Um, so th this is sort of the trajectory of, of, of Darwin's writing. And you see that trajectory of, uh, sorry, uh, of Darwin's thinking. You see the trajectory of his thinking kind of built in almost into the very structure of the origin of species, uh, which comes out in 1859. So here is, um, here is the table of contents of the origin. And um, this is color coded. <clears throat> And you can see it matching this diagram. You get a sense of, of the, different, the different insights that Darwin had built into this structure. The book opens with a chapter on variation under domestication, uh, which some historians have called this great uh, and very compelling analogy, right? Artificial selection with natural selection. He almost certainly coined natural selection with selection of the, uh, of the animal breeders in mind. Um, then he came to an understanding of the mechanism, as we would call it, of natural selection, um, building on naturally occurring variation and its distribution, the struggle for existence that he gleaned from Malthus. Um, putting these together, you get a selection dynamic. So in red here, you see the kind of um, deductive core, the, the, the mechanism of selection. And then the whole second half of this book is really applications, the explanatory power of this idea in diverse areas. A uh, Hewellian consilience, a consilience of inductions, where you're strengthened in your conviction that you're on the right track when you know, your model, your framework can explain seemingly unrelated sets of data. And so he's applying his idea to um, behavior um, or in hybridism, the fossil record, geographical distribution, uh, comparative anatomy, um, embryology, all of those sorts of things, uh, and coming away convinced that he can explain all of these things and more. Right. So this is this uh, I think um, encapsulates uh, very nicely that this this one book encapsulates very nicely the, the the trajectory of Darwin's thinking and coming to his ideas. And I want to show you that that Alfred Russell Wallace actually. Um, takes a rather similar approach. He has rather similar sets of insights, um, but he comes to these in a different order, in a, in a different way, right? Um, so we'll talk a little bit about, about Wallace. And um, I'll just mention that un unlike Darwin, I didn't say much biographically about Darwin's early life. Um, and I won't say much about Wallace's, except just to point out that perhaps he's a bit all the more remarkable Given his humble beginnings, you know, um, here as a as a as a young boy, I mean, his formal schooling uh, ended at the age of fourteen with the death of his father. Um, thereafter, he was really a, a self-taught, you know, kind of autodidact um, naturalist. I'm um, reading in in the free libraries of the mechanics institutes, um, attending free lectures whenever he could, um, learning trades, you know, working as an apprentice surveyor, as a builder. Um, he ultimately uh, spent one year as a school teacher when a, a downturn in the surveying business, um, working under his brother, um, had to result in his being laid off. So then he worked for a year as a, as a school teacher. Um, so I think it's worth our, our notice that Wallace is, um, you know, he is a uh, endlessly curious um, individual, self-taught, um, very large appetite for, for learning. Um, and he, he comes in the course of his kind of capacious readings, he comes across uh, important books in, um, in natural philosophy, in, in science. Um, he reads Charles Lyell, for example. And uh, he ultimately also comes across this very interesting book, right? Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation, um, a book that was published anonymously in 1844. It really was quite the, quite the scandalous tract, you know, it was arguing for um, transmutation in all things, you know, cosmological transmutation, um, transmutation in earth, transmutation in societies and political systems and really considered to be, um, you know, just uh, the worst kind of, um, of pretensions to, to, uh, to intellectualism by the, um, by the, by the, uh, the, the leading thinkers of the day, you know, a book that was denounced um, by parliament, you know, denounced by in every pulpit. Um, and, and yet, you know, despite the tendency that this had to sort of revulse the, um, the intelligentsia, uh, 
Um, it also did the service of kind of making this idea of transmutation an almost a household word, you know, kind of the, the air was kind of a buzz with this, this notion, this uh, admittedly scandalous notion of maybe of species change, you know, contrary to um, the received wisdom of scripture. Uh, and it maybe says something that uh, reading vestiges a year later in 1845, um, Wallace became immediately convinced that this was true that species do change. And, it, and it's, it's very uh, typical of Wallace that he becomes really, I, I don't wanna say obsessed, but he becomes just deeply impressed with this idea and wants to pursue, wants to, wants to better understand. And maybe even uh, with these grand pretensions, um, intellectual pretensions, perhaps even um, help solve this mystery of just how species may change. You know, that, that one year that Wallace was working as a school teacher uh, was fateful in that um, he, he was in the town of Leicester in England where he was fortunate to meet a kindred spirit, um, Henry Walter Bates, uh, another young guy, also sort of self-taught, um, passionate amateur entomologist and turned Wallace on to beetles and collecting insects, beetles and butterflies ma mainly. Um, and the two of them really hit it off and clearly talking about not just uh, collecting and those sorts of things, but also more philosophical ideas, you know, discussing their, their philosophical readings of Charles Lyell and, and vestiges and such. And after Wallace moved away at the end of this year, moved away from Leicester, um, moving back to Wales, um, his older brother who had the surveying business had, had um, tragically um, died, succumbed to an illness, and he moved to Wales to help put his brother's um, affairs in, in order and kind of take, take on the surveying business and, and keep things going along with his brother, John. And uh, we're fortunate in a way that this happened in that um, he's then forced to confer with his kindred spirit buddy, you know, back in Leicester um, by letter. Um, and so these, many of these letters survive. And so, for example, we know from a letter written to Bates in November of 1845, that Wallace asks, you know, have you read vestiges of the natural history of creation? Or is it out of your line? You know, what do you think about this book? And evidently, um, you know, Bates did not uh, re respond very favorably uh, because Wallace then wrote back to say, I have a rather more favorable opinion of vestiges than you appear to have. And he goes on to sort of elaborate a bit. And this is a quote from the letter. Um, I do not consider it as a hasty generalization, but as an ingenious hypothesis, strongly supported by some striking facts. And he comes, goes on and on. You, know, you can see how deeply impressed he is by the arguments of this, uh, of this book, uh, The Vestiges. Um, two years later, we find Wallace writing again um, to his friend. Uh, after a visit to Paris, he has an opportunity to visit the museum there, the great natural history museum in Paris and look at the insect collections. And, and he, he says to his friend, he's dissatisfied with a mere local collection. He wants to study some one family thoroughly. And very tellingly, he says, and I quote, principally with a view to the theory of the origin of species. Uh, and then he says, he's sure that this will yield definite results, you know. Well, results of what? I mean, he doesn't specify. What is he getting at? My take would be, you know, Wallace wants to undertake a comprehensive analysis of the species and the varieties of some widely distributed group, and that this will yield insight into how new species arise, right? So here we see, you know, Wallace, um, you know, in his early 20s, really thinking rather deeply uh, and maybe audaciously given his background and his meager circumstances about these, these interesting ideas. Um, well, it's, you know, it's astonishing that, you know, just, you know, a few months after, you know, penning that letter, um, Wallace and Bates find themselves in South America. Um, they, they managed to pull off this incredible scheme, um, considering that they have little by way of education, by way of resources, by way of social connections or social spending, um, they make their way to South America. And the idea was to pay their way with collections. Um, and you see them as paying close attention to um, diversity, what we would call biodiversity, but also geographical distribution and geology, especially in, in, in Wallace's case. Wallace is there four years, Bates stayed a total of 11 years. And I wanna just emphasize that you know, it's too easy to assume uh, 
uh, that Wallace is a mere collector. You know, he's just excited about traveling, seeing the world, collecting specimens. You know, there's much more to it than that. We see from his writings, from his letters, like the ones I just uh, shared with you to Bates, that you know, he's interested in, in more profound things. You know, my take is Wallace did not travel in order to collect. He really collected in order to travel, right? His collections were paying the bills, enabling him to be in these interesting places, immersing himself in, in foreign cultures, in biodiversity, in trying to make observations. I think he's kind of groping at this point, trying to figure out you know, um, can he discern any patterns and gain some insight into species origins? And at the end of four years, um, who knows? You know, we, we don't know the full range of his insights um, from this time uh, because we do know that as Wallace was making his way home with nearly two years worth of collections that had been held up in the customs house and, um, you know, just a prodigious quantity of, of, of notebooks and uh, and other materials, even live, um, live animals, um, that he suffered great tragedy. Mid-Atlantic, his ship burned, um, taking with it almost all of his notes, um, certainly all of the specimens he had um, at, at that point. Um, just, you know, an incredible blow to this guy, you know, just losing, you know, virtually everything. We'll never know all of the ideas that he had confided to his notebooks at that time and what insights he, he may have had. But fortunately for us, you know, he was able to piece together um, elements of his notebooks, right, from letters home. Um, certainly other collections had been sent home. He certainly had a lot of material kind of in his sort of, um, you know, his mental database. And so he was able to come out with a couple of books, you know, a travel narrative, a book on palms. Um, but we also see some very telling comments in some of the papers that Wallace uh, read and published uh, right after this time. This is from 1853, where he's commenting on uh, heliconius butterflies of the Amazon uh, basin. And he makes some interesting observations in this, in this paper. He notes that, they, that this is a group um, rich and closely related species and varieties. Many of them have a very limited range. And here he's connecting species with, with a geological context, right? That, that these species and varieties seem to be found in geologically young or very recent areas. And um, he, he reveals a kind of hypothesis he has. He kind of throws out a kind of working hypothesis. And this is a quote, we may fairly regard um, those you know, insects, those species and varieties peculiar to geologically young areas as among the youngest of species, he says, the latest in the long series of modifications which the forms of animal life have undergone. You know, that is a transmutational statement, right? The youngest of species, the latest in the long line of modifications that the forms of animal life have undergone. Um, he's really putting it out there. He has this vision of species change over time, no mechanism, just the idea, just the fact of species changing over time. Um, very, very, very telling. Although this didn't seem to elicit any pushback, any comment you know, from those that, that heard or read this paper. Some 18 months later, Wallace um, continues his travels, but this time you know, he heads east. He heads to Southeast Asia, to the great Malay archipelago. And there we see him continuing to pursue this, this, this fascinating idea that he's, he's really fixated on. Uh, I think it's telling that in very short order, um, a stunning paper is, is published by, by Wallace. He writes this out um, when he is staying near Kuching in Sarawak. This is, became known as the Sarawak uh, Law Paper, um, Sarawak in Northern uh, Borneo. And the paper is entitled On the Law Which Has Regulated the Introduction of New Species. And here we see Wallace really connecting some dots that we saw Darwin connect some years prior. Right? He's observing patterns in the distribution and relationships of species in space, geographically, and time, right, in terms of their distribution in the fossil record. And he puts these together and says, you know, every species has come into existence coincident in space and time with a pre-existing closely allied species. Now he doesn't use the word transmutation. 
he doesn't explicitly suggest that this is transmutation, it certainly sounds an awful lot like it. This idea that however new species arise, it happens in the immediate proximity to a pre-existing closely related species. You can't help but see that what he's getting at here is that somehow these new species are derived from those pre-existing species, right? So you know that he's been thinking about this for quite a while. This is not um, developed through, uh, you know, years of exploration in the East. This comes rather early in his, uh, after his arrival in the East. So it's something that he's been formulating and, and thinking about. So like Darwin, we see that Wallace realizes that species relationships in space and time suggest transmutation. He's really on, this, on this, this track, this path. And I want to point out one other thing about this paper. And this is, this is Wallace, um, maybe the first indication in public anyway, of his thinking in these consilience-like terms. You know, I talked about Darwin's consilience and, and trying to find evidence in um, multiple unrelated lines, you know, looking at the geographical distribution and comparative anatomy and behavior and all of those sorts of things. Well, in this paper, Wallace points out in his conclusion that this law that he, that he discerns uh, connects together and renders intelligible a vast number of independent and hitherto unexplained facts about species. Their classification, right? Uh, geographical distribution, geological sequence, morphological relationships, peculiarities like rudimentary organs. He explicitly ref, uh, refers to the affinities of them um, as uh, complicated branching, as intricate as a gnarled oak or the vascular system of the human body, very much tree-like thinking, right? So I, I see this as, um, as one indication of a public writing by Wallace that he is thinking in consilience terms, right? It certainly doesn't use that that term, but that's essentially what we can see him doing. This is like Darwin's note to self. You can look for evidence in these multiple and unrelated lines and tie them together by this into this single beautiful explanatory framework, right? Um, so I mentioned that this is a public um, writing. I think what's even more telling and, and, and utterly fascinating is his private writings. So we find that that Wallace at this time is hot on the trail of this species question, confiding quite a few interesting evolutionary ruminations and even arguments in a book that is now known as the Species Notebook of 1855 to 1859, a notebook which now resides in the library of the Linnaean Society of London. And here we find um, Wallace actually formulating a plan, a concerted um, organized plan to lay out the case for transmutation as evolution was called and actually revealing um, uh, a plan to write a book on the subject. Um, this, this book may have been entitled, had it ever been published, had it ever been written, something like On the Organic Law of Change. Um, this was first suggested by the historian um, Lewis McKinney, who noted that on this page, 35 of this notebook, Darwin, um, sorry, Wallace heads up this whole section with this note for organic law of change. This, this, this begins many, many pages of evolutionary speculations. And I, I was very fortunate you know, through the, uh, the generosity of the Linnaean Society um, to be able to publish in 2013 with Harvard University Press a, uh, an, an annotated um, facsimile edition of this amazing notebook revealing all of Wallace's evolutionary thinking. So I want to just point out that um, Wallace's particular line of attack, he has squarely in his sights the country's leading naturalist, the leading naturalist who is also the leading voice against the possibility of species change. And that is Charles Lyell, the great geologist. Lyell's Principles of Geology, published in three volumes between 1830 and 1833, um, were really um, taken as you know, the, um, the, the, the great vision for um, changes in the earth. And as you see in the subtitle here, this is, this is uh, Lyle's attempt to explain um, the, the former changes of the earth's surface by reference to causes now in operation. But in the process, he also takes on 
the idea of species change and he is not favorable. Um, early on, he was actually quite interested in this idea, but on religious grounds, Lyle came to the idea that um, you know, he just really couldn't stomach the implications for humans and the way it seemed to undermine or contradict scripture. And so he actually, um, he wrote in, in this book, some uh, four chapters, uh, detailed chapters, marshalling a whole range of arguments, torpedoing this idea of species change. Now, um, you know, this was, this was something that uh, Wallace certainly recognized as a problem. He, he tried to tackle this directly. And we also see that, um, as we'll see in a moment, that, that Darwin actually recognized this as a problem as well. Um, so the key point here is that Lyle's attack on transmutation in the principles was widely taken by naturalists of the day as the definitive damning statement on the matter. It's, it's the last word and it's simply not possible. And so we see Wallace being quite the contrarian that in the species notebook, he actually frames his arguments for transmutation in terms of refuting Charles Lyell. And as I said, we see Darwin really concerned about the same thing. This is, um, this is Darwin's heavily annotated uh, copy of one of the volumes of the, um, the second volume of the, of the principles. And I just wanna draw your attention to this one little passage that I, I highlight where, um, where Lyle is essentially saying, you know, um, species, you know, varieties can only change so much. After that, there, you know, that's it. There is no further possibility of any change whatsoever. And we see in the, um, in the margin here, notice that Darwin wrote, um, if this were true, adios theory. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, so he, he certainly recognized that this is, a, um, this is a, a critically important argument. And he's tackling this too in his own way, um, unbeknownst, of course, to Lyle or Wallace, for that matter, or anybody else. So just to remind you, then, um, we see Darwin's thinking about this subject reflected in the very structure of the origin Right? We have the analogy of domestication or domestic varieties. We have the deductive core of the mechanism of natural selection. We have the applications explaining patterns in diverse areas. And I wanna just um, make a case here that Wallace had just the same insights, but he came to them uh, by a different path and, and, and in a rather different order than, than Darwin. I'll give you just a couple of examples of that. So, so here we see uh, in the notebook, for example, Wallace is calling out Lyle on the question of what we can learn from domestic varieties. Lyle says, we learn nothing from domestic varieties. They can only vary within limits, only so much. They always revert back to their parental form, whatever they are. Wallace disagrees. You know, he says in, he can, says in his notebook, we can learn a great deal. Um, are not domestic varieties themselves evidence of transmutation? Now, here's a quote. Is not the change of one original animal into two such different animals as the greyhound and the bulldog a transmutation? Is there a more essential difference between the ass and giraffe and zebra than between these two varieties of dogs? Right. So he's he he, um, he well understands, like Darwin, that domesticated varieties kind of represent a form of transmutation. Um, he offers a scenario that we, um, that we can call the canine varieties scenario, uh, where he, he says to Lyle, what positive evidence do we even have that species only vary within limits, right? And then he has this, this kind of thought experiment. Suppose every variety of dog but one went extinct. Then take that one and spread it over the world. Let the peoples of the world um, develop new breeds, right? Would not many, many new dog breeds be developed from that one, right? And then what if you repeated the process and all of them except for one were rendered extinct? Then I quote here, does it not seem probable that again, new varieties would be produced, right? He's basically saying, you know, you know, rhetorically to Lyle, is there any evidence that some limit is reached and ever after the species is invariable? No, no, not at all. You can imagine you could do this indefinitely. You could keep developing new varieties, right? Just as there's endless variation for the continued transmutation of domestic varieties then, 
so must this be true of species in a state of nature. That's the trend of Wallace's thinking here. Um, so we can check that box, you know, domestic varieties. We can also check off the box, you know, about um, applications, the explanatory power. We see in the species notebook, Wallace with entries on geographical distribution, morphological relationships, instinct and habit, humans, arguments against divine design um, on, on all of these pages of this notebook plus 56 pages dedicated to refuting Charles Lyell explicitly, where he's written out Lyell's arguments from the principles and then rebutted them one after another. Here, I think we see a remarkable congruence in Wallace's and Darwin's thinking. You know, it, here we have, for example, a series of observations and arguments for transmutation. And you see on the left, I have the pages from, uh, from Wallace's species notebook, on the right, we have the equivalent comments from, um, from Darwin, from his notebooks, from, uh, from his books, such as The Origin of Species or The Forerunner uh, Manuscript, Natural Selection, and so on. Now, it would be compelling enough if this were the limit of the congruence between the thinking of the two, but the list really goes on. It goes on beyond just these observations and arguments. They concern many observations and arguments about geology and paleontology, about instinct and habit, about the human primate relationship and the nature of human variation, about geographical distribution, the meaning of islands and such, right? Morphology, affinity, it goes on and on and on, just remarkably congruent, almost exactly parallel to the point where sometimes they're actually citing the very same sources to back up their arguments, right? Completely unknown to one another. Very interesting. I explore all of this in, in my book, um, uh, Wallace Darwin and the Origin of Species, um, also published with Harvard, um, this one in 2014, um, and try to make a case for the remarkable parallel development of their thinking in, in this regard. Now here too, in this notebook, um, we see um, an in interesting um, argument by uh, by Wallace, um, where he kind of takes a pot shot at, at Lyle in his notebook, where he, he comments, and here I quote, it would be an extraordinary thing if while the modification of the Earth's surface took place by natural causes now in operation, you might recall that's the subtitle to, to Lyle's book, right? Yet the reproduction and introduction of new species requires special acts of creation or some process which doesn't present itself in the course of nature. Um, so this is, this is something that you know, he, he realizes is a, a useful rhetorical device. And then he makes a very uh, telling comment in his notebook. Note to self inserted kind of uh, um, in between the lines, introduce this and disprove all of Lyle's arguments at the commencement of my last chapter. Um, so here is one of the several places where Wallace reveals he's planning to write this all up as a book. This will be his book on transmutation, a kind of origin of species before the origin of species. Um, of course, he has no mechanism at this point, right? He has no how, but nonetheless, you could write a book making a very compelling case for the reality of species change. He also reveals this plan in a letter to his buddy Bates, who's still back in South America. Here's a letter uh, written in January of 1856. Um, Bates had congratulated him on the Sarawak law paper. And Wallace is replying saying, that paper is of course merely the announcement of the theory, not its development. I have prepared the plan and written portions of an extensive work embracing the subject in all its bearings and endeavoring to prove what in that paper I have only indicated. Um, here we see that plan and those portions, we see them in this notebook, in the species notebook. There's no question. Very, very interesting. Well, Dar um, Darwin himself was rather encouraging to, um, to, to Wallace. And it's worth pointing out that the two had been in touch. Um, Darwin first contacted uh, Wallace through Wallace's agent back in London, interested in um, the possibility of Wallace collecting some domesticated varieties, uh, for example, certain ducks and chickens from Southeast Asia for him. And they strike up a correspondence and they discover that um, they each have sort of this interest, let's say, in species and varieties. 
um, but they're rather kind of um, vague in their, they're um, not very explicit about just what they're working on. Um, Wallace at one point expresses to Darwin that he's a little disappointed, didn't hear much about um, this, this Sarawak law paper after he published it. And Darwin's very encouraging. He, he writes to Wallace, as you see here, um, that he can plainly see they have thought very much alike and they've come to similar conclusions. Darwin says he agrees to the truth of almost every word of his Sarawak law paper. Um, he also kind of maybe tries to warn Wallace off saying that this summer would be the 20th year he opened his, since he opened his first notebook and he's now preparing a great work for publication, right? This work um, focuses on how and in what way do species and varieties differ from each other. Um, he concludes by saying, I entirely agree with you on the little effects of climatic conditions. So Wallace actually takes this as great encouragement um, that he's really onto something that if so great a naturalist as, as, as Darwin actually agrees to the, to the truth of almost every word of his paper, you know, that's very exciting for him, you know? Um, so this is probably received when Wallace is in Makassar um, on, uh, on Sulawesi in June, uh, July rather, or August of 1857. And actually 1856 and 1857 to me is a crucial period in the development of Wallace's thinking. We see this, this, this real creative period of these interesting papers on um, the natural history of the Aru Islands, transformations of species, um, a kind of unrooted tree of relationships of birds, all of these things are put out in 1856, 1857. And shortly thereafter, um, rather famously, right, uh, by his own account, February 1858, um, in a, what's, what looks to be a malarial fit, Wallace suddenly has this great insight. He discovers this idea of natural selection. Um, that's to use Darwin's word. Dar Wallace never named the, the, the process, but he describes this process that is really very much this, um, this, this process of natural selection. And notice the title of the paper that he immediately writes on the tendency of varieties to depart indefinitely from the original type, right? This is Again, a reference to Lyle. Lyle's argument, and the thing he's arguing against with the canine variety scenario, is this idea that varieties can only change so much before they revert. But here he has a mechanism to show how varieties depart indefinitely from the parental form, right? They get more and more dissimilar. This was soon mailed off to Darwin, um, who in the meantime had been warned by Charles Lyle um, who had read the Sarawak law paper and was inspired to open his own notebook on the species question by it, um, warning Darwin that he should really publish his ideas. He felt that Wallace was, was um, really hot on the trail. Um, Darwin didn't quite agree, um, but he eventually uh, that May did um, agree to begin uh, a sketch of his ideas. Um, but of course, um, he wasn't quite fast enough. And by the time Wallace's essay reached him, right, he was then devastated. He was really, you know, uh, far from finished with his project. He wrote to Lyle, you know, that he had recommended that he read this paper by Wallace in the annals, um, as this has interested, um, uh, uh, which had interested Lyle, right? And he told him so. Wallace had that day sent him the enclosed paper and asked me to forward it to you. And I, I highlight this to make the point that um, Wallace is corresponding with Darwin, but he's really speaking to Lyle, right? His writings in his species notebook and that essay, and really also the Sarawak law paper, they're aimed at Charles Lyle. So the, the, the rest is sort of, you know, history, right? Um, and then that Wallace's species essay is received um, by a devastated Darwin that Charles Lyle and um, uh, Joseph Hooker, you know, Darwin's friends, um, rather quickly arrange for a reading of Wallace's paper along with unpublished extracts from some of uh, Darwin's writings on the subject. Um, Darwin did have priority here, but he had not gone public. And so this was a rather delicate arrangement. And he was really under the gun to um, get out there and publish his ideas in, um, in toto if he's gonna really assert his priority. And um, 
that following year, late the following year, on the origin of species, which Darwin regarded as a mere abstract of his ideas, is, is, is published. Um, it's interesting to note that sometime that uh, in 1858, Darwin, or maybe Hooker, sent to Wallace um, the table of contents of his book in progress. I think that he may have been trying to establish or, or prove that he really did have priority. He really was working on this. Wallace actually copied out the table of contents. This is taken uh, from, um, from the species notebook. He wrote out the table of contents and um, he really left it at that. Um, he just quietly abandoned his own book plans, uh, which is really a pity. You know, um, I really wish that Wallace had decided to go ahead and come forth with his own book on the subject as well. So let's just change gears here as we begin to wind down and just answer a couple of questions about this, this dynamic between Wallace and Darwin. Um, you know, did, did Darwin maybe receive that essay earlier than he seemed to say he did, which might suggest some, you know, some wrongdoing on his part? Well, you know, he, he may have. He may have received it a little bit early and really fretted about what to do, um, devastated, you know, about being scooped. Um, but he ultimately did the honorable thing and he shared it with, um, with, with Lyle as Wallace had asked him to. Um, is there any evidence that Darwin took any ideas from Wallace's essay and then added them to his book in progress? Um, no, I think there's no evidence at all um, to, to that effect. Did Wallace feel wronged by Darwin and his friends over this whole episode? No, actually quite the opposite. You know, here we find, um, you know, Wallace being um, just, you know, heaping praise upon, upon Darwin and the origin. When he eventually received his copy of the book, um, he, he wrote to friends, he wrote to family, you know, Mr. Darwin has given the world a new science. His name should, in my opinion, stand above that of every philosopher of ancient and modern times. The force of admiration can no further go. Um, he's really a magnanimous individual. You know, he, you know, he's interested in, you know, the science in a sense. He, he he's, he's, He's delighted that Darwin got there. He wants Darwin to um, get this idea out there. He's not so interested, it seems, in priority. Um, he, he returns home um, a few years later, 1862, a famous individual, right? I mean, just prodig prodigious how much he had accomplished in eight years. He covered 14,000 miles crisscrossing the Malay archipelago, collecting thousands and thousands and thousands of specimens, many new to science, dozens of papers written, dozens more written after he returned home, right? His travel memoir, The Malay Archipelago, was an instant bestseller. You know, he is, um, he is immediately welcomed into the, the circles of the, of the, the intelligentsia um, back in, in the London um, scientific salons. This is a little sampler of some of his more important scientific books. Malay Archipelago, Geographical Distribution of Animals, I mean, the founding document of modern evolutionary biogeography. Um, his his you know, incredible book on island life, um, his book on Darwinism, which we'll return to in a moment. We see Wallace really engaging with Darwin and others uh, back in London. Um, and really helping to refine evolutionary ideas, engaging with Darwin over sexual selection. He founds evolutionary biogeography. He formulates a theory of human physical and mental evolution, although he later backtracks over the evolution of mind, much to Darwin's consternation. Um, he articulates the modern biological species concept and, and the concept of reinforcement in speciation. Um, he actually introduces the theory of warning coloration, which we call aposematism today. Um, so he's really fully engaged with the, um, you know, with scientific society. But unlike many scientists, he also is, is, is socially engaged. He's writing about economics and philosophy. Um, he ultimately does become enchanted by spiritualism. And he, he begins to think about, um, about this idea about, about design in a, in a different way. Um, which doesn't endear him to, to Darwin and, um, and, and his friends. But it's fair to say by, by the end of Wallace's very long life, he died at the age of 90, he's certainly one of the more famous scientists in the world, honorary degrees, medals, an invitation to dine at the White House when he visited the US in 1886, 1887. Um, he's just, um, you know, he is hailed as one of the greatest of living scientists. So what happened then? What happened? 
that now, you know, Wallace is so little known compared to Darwin. Was he cheated in some way? You know, and I would say no, you know, he was not cheated. I would argue that, yes, you know, while we could say Darwin could have been a bit more um, generous in sharing the limelight, you know, here we see, for example, his references to natural selection and the origin. My theory appears 57 times, you know, our theory referring to Wallace, zero, you know. Um, he refers to Wallace four times in the origin, only indirectly referring to their co-discovery. You know, fair enough. I mean, this was his baby after all. It was something that he, he did come to um, back in the 1830s and, and really had nurtured. And so, so fair enough, he's a bit you know, protective of, of, of this idea, but, but there's more to it than that in terms of Wallace's relative eclipse. You know, I would argue that this is a, more a question of a Darwinian juggernaut than conspiracy because the Darwin name was already famous beginning with Darwin's grandfather Erasmus, the famous poet and physician. Um, his friend uh, Coleridge had coined the terms Darwinizing and Darwinism referring to Erasmus. Eventually, Charles Darwin became famous in his own right, especially after the Voyage of the Beagle, second edition in 1845. And then we see this idea of, of, of Darwin, you know, references to Darwin or Darwinism beginning to shift to Charles Darwin. And you kind of, you know, you get, you get some sense of that by playing around with tools like Google's Ngram viewer, where you see the names Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace um, in Google space, right? All of these, these digitized Google books. And you want to notice that um, that, that the name Darwin is, is very much around in the literature back in the 1840s, 1850s. This is pre-origin, right? Certainly gets a bump after the origin and then the big posthumous bump after 1882. And we see Wallace, um, you know, little, little known until after 1860 and then kind of increasing in, in, um, in, in recognition. Um, we also get a little bit of a posthumous bomb. So Wallace's name was never as famous as Darwin's, partly because Darwin's was already quite famous. Um, we see that in publications of the day. You know, here's a, a sampler of titles published in London between 1869 and 1900. Let's look at how many of these have the word Darwin or Darwinism in the title, right? Truly this juggernaut of associating this idea with this one individual. Um, and not Wallace. And of course, Wallace himself is complicit in this because he himself is constantly referring to the theory as Darwin's and Darwinism and Darwinian things. And he even titles uh, one of his most important books, Darwinism, right? So he's kind of playing a role in a sense in, in his own taking of the back seat, um, so to speak, to, to Darwin. But I wanna just sort of um, just reiterate that, you know, be that as it may, you know, Wallace and Darwin clearly were remarkably congruent in the development of their evolutionary thinking, right? They were together, certainly our first guides to the evolutionary process. There's no question of that. And Wallace absolutely deserves greater recognition for the depth and breadth of his evolutionary insights. Um, we, I hope that I've convinced you in this presentation um, that um, this is not uh, just a, a mere a uh, specimen collector who got lucky, but this is someone who uh, a self-taught kind of autodidact um, uh, philosophical naturalist pursuing against all odds, one of the greatest scientific mysteries of the day and actually succeeding in solving this mystery. So with that, I just wanna thank you all very much. And of course I wanna um, give a quick shout out to the, my many friends, my family and many collaborators, institutions, and funding agencies that have made my Wallace and Darwin studies possible. So thanks again. Thank you so much, Jim. This was just so interesting. Um, and I, I know we are actually almost out of time. So I, I may ask you and our viewers to stay on an extra five minutes or so, just so we can get to some of the questions that are coming in. And I encourage all of you to continue to send your questions and comments to the um, Q&A box. So I'd actually love yeah. to start with this question that came in. I think this is so interesting. Um, so one of our viewers said, I did not have the chance to learn about Alfred Russell as a child, but of course, Charles Darwin was part of the curriculum. In your opinion, what is the reason we don't mention Wallace and teach about him, but we talk about Charles Darwin? Has the history been fair to Wallace? Mm. Very good question. I think the, the history hasn't quite been fair enough to Wallace. 
I think it's understandable how the name Darwin had become almost a household term or a household name. Um, and in, you know, in the limited space of a science curriculum, an introductory science curriculum, you can see how it would be a kind of the greatest hits, you know, and just sort of sound bites about contributions of, of just certain key individuals. And, and often, you know, figures like a Wallace are just um, given short shrift in, in, that, in that way. So I, I do think that we need to be more cognizant of that and try to elevate him a bit more. Thank you. Um, so another question from one of our viewers, what influence did Alexander von Humboldt have on Wallace's career and thinking? Mm. I mentioned Humboldt as one of um, Wallace's inspirations. You know, certainly we know uh, very inspiring to Darwin and, and to Wallace too, reading him in the Mechanics Institute's libraries. And I think that while that Humboldt had this effect on many young and aspiring naturalists of, of, of that generation, on um, this, this passion, on um, this desire to travel, to see the world, the exotic tropics, and to just, you know, just immerse themselves in, in the natural world and, 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 and try to study and learn about these, um, the, the rarities that, that occur there. Um, so I think that we could fairly say that Humboldt was one of several inspirations for Wallace and in inspiring him to want to um, become a more philosophical naturalist and to travel. Thank you. What might Wallace have accomplished if Darwin had come along 20 years later or perhaps 20 years earlier? We have several questions about the age difference and if you know one was around before the other. Yeah, yeah, very good, good question. I, well, you know, so Wallace is what, 14 years um, younger than, than Darwin and cert almost certainly, right, if, um, you know, this idea of natural selection would have been discovered um, by somebody, if not Wallace or, or Darwin, I think that um, it's hard to say whether he would have come upon natural selection when he did. Clearly, he was planning on writing a book arguing for evolution. And he would have done that had it not been for, for, for Darwin. You know, he's kind of, you know, intersecting with Darwin in, in, in that way. Um, you know, so had, had, had Darwin kind of not come along, I think that Wallace would have probably published what would be hailed today as, as a seminal book uh, arguing for the reality of transmutation, whether or not there would be the mechanism behind it, natural selection, kind of an interesting speculation. Thank you, Jim. And our next question here, can you educate us on the definition of the species? On the definition of what, of species, I'm sorry? Yes. Yeah, well, you know, species is, um, it's one of those terms that um, is, has been and is defined in, in different ways. Um, I think that Darwin and Wallace kind of uh, looked at this uh, as much the way we might today. I mean, the, the common kind of, you know, textbook definition of species where we talk about, um, you know, kind of self-contained, reproductively isolated um, populations um, that, don't, that don't readily interbreed with other um, such populations. Uh, that's something like what Darwin and Wallace um, uh, believed as well. Um, they, they, Wallace um, specifically in 1864 in his uh, a famous paper on swallowtail butterflies kind of talked about, you know, the difficulties of discerning species and varieties and, and he's rather clear in defining species as um, he thinks in terms of what we would call a kind of a reproductively isolated group. Okay, thank you. Now he does go on to say that that's problematic, that, the, that any definition is problematic and we would agree with that today as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a question here, or, or perhaps a comment. We've heard the term survival of the fittest. Um, did that term come from Darwin or Wallace or neither of them? Uh, this idea was, um, was kicked around, you know, this, so it did not originate really with, with, um, with either of them, certainly, struggle for existence was an idea that had been that had been discussed extensively. Um, survival of the fittest, I, I believe, actually came from Spencer. Um, so Herbert Spencer, the philosopher and sometime kind of evolutionary speculative philosopher, I think, um, maybe coined coined that that term. Thank um, you. And it's very evocative, so it was seized mm -hmm. upon. Um, okay, let's see here. We have lots of questions. Um, how, how Wallace, can you comment on how Wallace's thinking may be relevant to modern day conservation of biodiversity? Mm. 
Huh, yeah, another good, good question. Well, um, Wallace, um, of course, we can say in one sense, Wallace contributed to the problem, right, um, of his, his time, you know, um, collecting meant killing lots and lots of things, not just one specimen, but many, many specimens, right? Uh, we could say he's kind of the beginning of a kind of a real problem. Um, but he also later in life came to realize that um, we need to think about what we would call today conservation. I mean, he wrote rather passionately about this idea of the need to conserve natural areas. Um, he made an interesting argument saying that there was a, a strange kind of disconnect with um, those who would kind of uh, cite species as uh, proof for the existence of a creator, but then uncaringly let them all go go extinct. You know, and we need to be more consistent. And if um, if we're if we're going to invoke a creator and the beauty of creation, we need to do right by it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Another question um, from our, from one of our viewers was Lyle's book a catalyst for the timing of the evolution theories? Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I would say that um, Lyle's book, you know, Lyle was both the, the kind of inspiration and the foil for both Wallace and Darwin. So I think you could say that it was a catalyst in that, you know, it was, it's, you know, so well written and it was, you know, so it was taken to be the definitive statement against the possibility of species change. So naturally it would, for someone like Wallace especially, it would be, you know, the target to attack if you're trying to make a case for the possibility of, of species change. So we could say that, they, that Lyle gave both of them um, really a very cogent set of arguments to then work against. Thank you. And Jim, I'm gonna end with this question. So um, we know that Wallace lived a, a very long life. I think you said he lived until he was in his 80s or 90s. Um, if, from his perspective, what would you say was his proudest accomplishment? Mm. His proudest accomplishment? No. Yeah, that's a that's a that's an interesting question too. I think that I think he was very proud of his scientific accomplishments. And um, we find him writing later in life. Um, he kind of wrote out, you know, um, some of what he considered to be, you know, his greatest contributions. Um, but he also was something of a speculative philosopher. I mean, I alluded to his getting interested in spiritualism, and mm -hmm. and he was deeply committed to um, to understanding and improving the the um, you know the 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 plight of of working people. He's thinking about economics. He's he's thinking about. Um, about philosophy that way. So he was also very proud, I think, of um, the ways that he was able to um, bridge these two worlds and make, um, he tried to make substantial contributions in, in both of those worlds. Thank you. I know that I know that's a difficult question. <laughs> a, um, a, well, Jim, yeah. thank you so much on behalf of the Harvard travel team and our alumni community. Um, this has just been such a wonderful hour, hour and six minutes now, and we've learned about <laughs> some extraordinary um, scientists. So thank you again. Um, as soon as you close out of this webinar, a brief survey will appear. We'd be grateful if you take a few moments to complete the survey. And as a reminder, the recording of this lecture will be shared with you. Um, Jim is scheduled to lead a truly adventurous trip next year, the Natural Gems and Luxury Lodges of Patagonia, October 26th to November 6th. Um, if you'd like to check out more information on the trip, I encourage you to explore the link that will be populated into the chat. Um, and finally, we have a fabulous lineup of fall travel talks, some of which you will see on your screen. So um, I hope that you will enjoy, or excuse me, I hope that you will um, join us for more engaging conversations and you will find some registration links in the chat as well. Um, thank you so much for joining us and I appreciate all of those of you who stayed on later um, and take care. Thanks again, Jim. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Much appreciated.